Thank you, guys. Well, we have the immense privilege to hear from a man who really needs no introduction, Dr. Stephen J. Lawson is an expositor amongst expositors and a preacher among preachers. And it's our privilege to hear from him this evening. Dr. Lawson is a teaching fellow at Ligonier Ministries. He's a president of One Passion Ministries and a preaching professor at the Master's Seminary. We really look forward to hearing the Word of God tonight. And again, thank you, Dr. Lawson, for coming all this way. Would you come and minister to us this evening? Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's such a joy uh, to be here tonight. I was here eight years ago, and it's always uh, an encouragement when someone invites you to come preach. It's a double encouragement when you're invited back. So thank you for having me uh, back It's a joy to reconnect with uh, Phil Johnston, Uh, Phil Johnston, that's Phil there, Matthew Johnston here. Um, They were up here together at the same time, and they just kind of blended in my mind. Um, Matthew is a former student of mine at the Master's Seminary, and I'm just very proud to have this relationship with him. And so now to be able to stand in his pulpit and to preach where the Word of God is honored Uh, here is just a special delight for me, Matthew, so thank you so very much. It's good to be with my good friend, Philip DeCourcy. Looking forward to hearing uh, Phil preach tomorrow and to be with Phil Henderson again. So um, what a great opportunity this is. Um, Our conference theme is Live the Truth, Uh, Sanctification. Uh, living the Christian life. And there's so many different places, uh, obviously, where we could go in the Word of God tonight, but uh, my heart seems to be steered to Hebrews chapter 12. So if you take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and tonight I want us to look at the first verse in Hebrews chapter 12. Um, I'd like to begin by reading this text and uh, to read a couple of verses, but we're going to limit ourselves tonight uh, to the first verse because it's so foundational for what we'll have to say for the rest of the week. Hebrews chapter 12, I want to begin reading in verse 1, and the theme for our message tonight is run the race. This is God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's been well said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Just a picture can communicate an entire library of thought. And in the Christian life, in the Bible, there are many different pictures that are given of what a Christian is and how to live the Christian life. And sanctification is so multidimensional that no one picture encompasses the whole. It's like a diamond that has many different cuts on all the different sides, and you hold it up to the light, and all the different colors refract from the different sides. So the picture of the Christian life is so comprehensive that it takes many different pictures and and images to convey to us the fullness of what it is 
to be a Christian and how to grow as a Christian. For example, the Bible says that we're sons and daughters. That is to say, we're in the family of God. We've been born again, and we bear the divine nature within us. The very nature of God and the very life of God is, is in us. And we're brothers and sisters in, in Christ in the same family. And we have family duties and family responsibilities. And the Father cares for us and protects us. And we are to be obedient to our Father in heaven. Uh, another picture is that of being a disciple, which means to be a, a, a learner and a follower of Jesus Christ. And we're in the school of discipleship, and we are students, and we're always learning and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, another picture is that of being a sheep. Uh, where we follow the good shepherd and he leads us beside green pastures and into uh, beside still waters and into green pastures and he nurtures us and cares for us and we're totally defenseless without him so many elements of the christian life come out that way we're described as a soldier we've been enlisted into active duty and we're to fight the good fight, and we have an enemy, and, and we serve under the, the Lord of hosts, and we're marching into battle for the truth of the Word of God. Uh, we're also pictured as stones, uh, living stones, and we come together. We form the, the living temple of, of God. E each of these pictures conveys a different element of what it is to follow Christ, to grow as a Christian. And in the times that we will spend together tonight and the next three times that I, I will have the opportunity to speak to you, this text focuses upon another picture, one that you and I need to be reminded of again and again and again. And it is that of an athlete. It is that of a runner. It is that of being in the race for God, that we can't be passive. We cannot be complacent. We've got to be in the race, and we've got to pursue holiness with all of the might by the grace of God that we can possibly give, and we must compete according to the rules, or we are disqualified. The Bible uses this metaphor repeatedly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, Do you not know that, that those who run in a race all run to win? And that we run for an incorruptible prize? In Philippians chapter 3, it says, Forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to what lies ahead. We press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, I have run the race, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. It is this image of the runner, the athlete, that I want us to focus on and to dwell upon because if you are born again, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're in the race. And you're an athlete, a spiritual athlete. And for you to grow as a Christian necessitates that we understand and implement what is, this, what is in this passage. Now, tonight I want us to look simply at, at verse 1. And to understand this passage, we have to think of a large stadium the All Blacks playing against the British Lions. It's a standing room only. It's jam-packed. And there's a track. And there are runners on the track. And there are weights that they have to, to shed and set aside. And there are encumbrances that must not entangle them. And there is a strength that they must receive from God if they are to run the race. So tonight, I want us to look just simply at verse 1. There's so much in verse 1. 
And as we look at this text now tonight, I want you to note six things. Number one, I want you to note the stadium. As verse 1 begins, it is the imagery of, a, of an enormous stadium that is large enough to hold a vast throng of cheering spectators. Now, verse 1 begins, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses... The we refers to all believers. And when he says, we have so great a cloud of witnesses, this is all pointing back to the previous chapter. Because verse 1 begins, therefore. And you know whenever you see a therefore, you need to see what it's there for, right? It all points back to the previous chapter. God's hall of fame. The heroes of the faith. And they have already run their race. And they have competed like world-class athletes. And they have distinguished themselves so much so that in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith Moses, and the list goes on. And they have competed in the race of faith and they have won the prize. And they are now seated in the grandstands. And as we live our Christian life, they are cheering us on. Now, they are cheering us on not because they look down from heaven and see us. They actually bear witness to us by the example of their lives. We witness them. They don't witness us. And as they are seated in the grandstands of heaven, and that is the imagery here of so great a cloud of witnesses, they're up there, up in the clouds, up beyond the clouds. And it's not a small cloud, it says a great cloud, a mega crowd of witnesses, they bear witness to you and to me on how to run the race. You and I need examples. You and I need heroes. You and I need those who are, who are out ahead of us and who have already competed and who have excelled in the race for us to receive the encouragement of the example of their lives. And this verse is saying that as you live your Christian life, you are living it in a sold-out, standing-room-only stadium. You're not alone. It is loud. It is a raucous crowd. And you have the crowd on all side of you, and you are to be energized by this crowd. I, I'm an old athlete. Carl Hargrove is an old athlete. And when you play in a large stadium... I've played college football in stadiums 50, 60, 70, as large as 80,000 people, and you come out of that tunnel, and you step out onto the field, and the band is playing, and the cheerleaders are cheering, and the people rise to their feet. It is so loud you cannot even hear the person next to you. And it's like an IV hookup of adrenaline. And it just surges. And you can run faster. You can jump higher than if you were in a stadium all by yourself on a Tuesday night. And the lights are turned out. And there's not a person in the stadium. You call that home court advantage. You call that home field advantage. Because it's like the wind is at your back, and it is propelling you forward, and you are so, you feel a sense of invincibility, you feel a sense of, of empowerment, because everyone is cheering for you and cheering you on. That's exactly the picture here in verse 1. It is the stadium 
And as you walk through Hebrews chapter 11, it's as if Moses and Abraham have a megaphone and pom-poms in their hand, and they are cheering you on as you live your Christian life. And if you can't hear them, get the cotton out of your ears because they are cheering you on. You may say tonight, you know, I just feel like I'm the only Christian in my family. I feel like I'm the only Christian down at work. I feel like I'm the only Christian in my neighborhood. And, and you kind of begin to be a little discouraged and a little defeated. And then you hear Noah say to you, let me tell you what it's like to be all alone. I was all alone for almost a century or more than a century. Put your faith in God. Stand strong for God. Some of you may say tonight, you know, I, I know God is leading me, but I don't know where He's leading me. I don't know what the future holds. I, I don't think I can take another step forward. And Abraham says, let me tell you what it's like to be called by God and not know where you're going. As he was called out of the Ur of Chaldees, and God led him to a land of which he knew not, and God met him there, and it was all a part of the plan of God, Abraham is screaming encouragement to us. You can move forward by faith. And someone else here tonight may be saying, you know, I just feel like life has passed me by. I, I'm kind of old. And it doesn't seem like there's any ministry yet in front of me. And Moses says, let me tell you, when I was 80 years old, I was out in the wilderness, and there was a burning bush, and it wasn't all over with my ministry. In fact, it was just now starting. Be encouraged as you read Hebrews chapter 11. Now, this says to me that every one of us here tonight needs to master the Old Testament. We need to know the stories and the characters and the narratives of the Old Testament, or you're living your Christian life in an empty stadium. And you're living your Christian life without the encouragement that God desires you to have. And if that's not enough, you need to be a student of church history. You need to read Christian biographies. You need to read about great men and women of God who are already seated up there in the heavenly grandstands and by the, the courage and the commitment of their lives, they are screaming encouragement to us tonight. Do you need to be encouraged as you live your Christian life? I do. The devil is a great discourager. It's been said that the devil was having a garage sale and had all of his tools out on the front driveway and was selling them. And a man walked up and he looked at each of the different pieces of, of the tools and the instruments that the devil loves to use and he came to one particular instrument and he turned over the price tag and it was an amount so staggering the man asked the devil, what is this tool? It's more expensive than all the other tools put together. The devil said, that's the tool of discouragement. And when I can pry open a man or a woman's heart with discouragement, all these other tools are so effective. We all face discouragement at times in the Christian life. And it makes us want to slow down in the race. It, it makes us want to, to even sit down in the midst of the race. But we've got to be reminded of the stadium in which we are living our Christian lives. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is the stadium. Open your eyes. Open your ears. And be inspired by God. But second, not only the stadium, I want you to note the stripping down. Because any athlete who's going to run a race, 
knows that all excess baggage must be set aside. So continue to read verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that's the stadium, let us lay aside every encumbrance. These encumbrances are not sinful things. That comes next in the verse. These are lawful things. They're just unnecessary, and they slow us down. Can you imagine a man walking up to the start of a race, and he puts his heels into the starting blocks, and he is ready to explode out of the out of the gates to run the race, and he has a three-piece suit on, and he's got an overcoat on around that. He's got a heavy briefcase in one hand. He, he's got big old clunker shoes on, and he is trying to run the race. I'll tell you one thing about that man. He's not serious about winning. He may be going through the motions and just want to get a letter jacket or have his picture in the annual or something, be on the team. But he's not serious about winning. Because if he was serious about winning this race, every bit of unnecessary weight would be shed aside and put to the, to the side, and he would run as lightly as he possibly could. And what are these things? Well, these are things that are permissible. They're not sinful, as I've already said. It's kind of too much of a good thing that keeps us from the best things in the Christian life. So how much, you ask, should I let go in my life? Television, hobby, yard, fishing, hunting. I'm not going to mention golf. <laughs> well, let me ask you this question. How fast do you want to run, and how much do you want to win? You answer those two questions, and I'll tell you how much needs to go. Whatever is unnecessary baggage in your life, it is the good things that are so often the enemy of the best things in the Christian life. You may ask me the question then, well, can I not have recreation? You need recreation. I need recreation. You know what the word recreation means? Recreation. You need times in your life. You need days. You need hours where you are recreated, you're replenished, your batteries are, are being recharged. So this is not saying that, that we cannot have any uh, outside pleasures. You and I need outside pleasures. But they're to be our servant and not our master. And far too often, people become caught up with their computer, with surfing, with Googling, with blogging, with their yard. It could even be grandchildren are keeping you from really being in the race and serving the Lord to the extent that you ought to be. So what baggage is there in your life that could really just be jettisoned? Do you know in the first century when they ran, do you know that the men completely stripped down and ran without any clothing on whatsoever? It was an offense to the Jews. It was an offense to the women. But they literally did not want one ounce of clothing to hold them back. They wanted every advantage to run the race and to win the race, they were fully committed in that sense. 
So as you look at your Christian life tonight, as you would think about where you are in running the race of faith, what is it that really is weighing you down that's like an overcoat, that's like a, a three-piece suit, that, that is like something that's really not propelling you forward. It's like you're trying to drive your car with the emergency brake on. It's just holding you back. This is the stripping down of which the writer of Hebrews says must go. But as we continue to look at this, we've seen the stadium and we've seen the stripping down. I want you to note the stumbling sin. Because as we continue to look at verse 1, he says, Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. Not some, not most, every single encumbrance. Now, he goes on to say, and, and the word and distinguishes now the encumbrance from what follows, and the sin which so easily entangles us. The picture here is of the runner as he comes to start the race, and he has a long flowing robe that reaches all the way to the ground. If he keeps that long robe on, it is inevitable that his feet are going to become tied up, and he is going to trip and fall. And worse than slowing down with an encumbrance is being tripped up by sin. Now this says, the sin. Not a sin, but the sin. And there's much debate among Bible teachers and commentators, what is the sin? I'm here to unpick all the mysteries tonight of the centuries and to let you know what the sin is. In this context, the sin is the failure to trust God. Because the entire previous chapter, Hebrews 11, is God's hall of faith. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. Again and again and again, the entire focus and emphasis is upon faith, trusting God, relying upon God, obeying God. And he will say in verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who believes God must come to Him in faith. And so now in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, he talks about the faith, excuse me, the sin. I think it's obvious in the context what the sin is. It is the total antithesis of what Noah and Enoch and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and David and Samson and Jephthah and all of the like demonstrated. It is the opposite of faith, which is a failure to trust God in the difficult times of life. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. It is the need that we have to trust God as we find ourselves in difficult places and at difficult intersections of life. I wonder where you need to trust God tonight. 
I wonder where you are looking to yourself and your own solutions and your own way to work your way through this. I, I wonder where tonight you need to be looking to God and not to others and not to yourself. And could it be with your career? Could it be with your children? Could it be with your finances? Could it be with your parenting? Could it be with your family? Could it be with your ministry? Whatever that is, it is the sin of failing to trust God that so easily entangles us. That is why in every aspect of our Christian lives, every step of running this race is a step of faith. We entered the race by faith. We progress by faith. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, Colossians 2, 6, and 7. We enter by faith. We grow by faith. We develop by faith. It is all of faith. This is the stumbling sin. I want you to note fourth, the steadfastness, because there is something even worse than tripping and falling. It is to stop running altogether. And so that is why the writer of Hebrews continues in this verse, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that's the stadium, let us also lay aside Every encumbrance, that's the stripping down, and the sin which so easily entangles us, that's the stumbling sin, and let us run with endurance. This word run is in the present tense. Every moment of every day, we are to be running this race. We're not to be merely walking, not merely jogging, uh, not merely slowing down. We are to be running this race with constant motion toward the goal, never content with where we are in the spiritual life, always moving out, always moving forward, always pursuing holiness, always running with endurance. That's the steadfastness. This word endurance literally means out of the original language to bear up under. With great pressure, great stress, even great trials pressing down upon you, how easy it is to, to want to now slow down and even stop. But the writer of Hebrews says, let us run with endurance, no matter how tired our legs, no ha matter how heavy our arms, no matter how painful our feet. We must be always pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And as long as you are in the race, you must be running. And you may retire from your, your vocation and your career, but you'll never retire with the Lord, and you'll never retire from running with this race. As long as you and I are on planet Earth and are breathing, we must press on. Notice the emphasis on endurance. He says it here in verse 1, let us run with endurance. Look at the next verse. Jesus, who for the joy set before Him, endured the cross. Look at verse 3, for consider Him who has endured. No one has ever endured like the Lord Jesus Christ. He went all the way to Calvary. He didn't pull up short at all. In the face of opposition, in the face of persecution, in the face of being deserted by others, he pressed on in running the race for God. He went all the way, and at the finish line, he said, 
It is finished. Look at verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. Go back to chapter 10 and verse 36 before God's Hall of Fame starts. The writer of Hebrews says to these early believers, for you have need of endurance. This is the steadfastness that the Lord calls for in our Christian lives. And we must always be pressing on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The date was July the 4th, 15, excuse me, 1952. July 4th, 1952. And a great female swimmer whose name was Florence Chadwick purposed that she would do something no woman had ever done before. That she would swim from the Catalina Islands 21 miles to the coast of California. She was the first woman to ever swim the Atlantic, Cha the English Channel. In fact, she swam it one way, turned around, and swam it back the other way. She got into the water. There were boats around her to fight off the sharks. Her trainer, her mother, was in the boat, encouraging her along the way. She swam, and she swam, and she swam. And a dense fog settled in to the Pacific. She could no longer see where she was going. She could no longer see the coastline. She began to get tired. She began to get weary. And she did the unthinkable. She said to her mother, I can't go any further. Her mother called out, just a little bit further, just a little bit further. She said, pull me out of the water. They pulled her out of the water, and as the fog rose, she could have walked onto the coast. She was within a couple hundred yards because she had lost sight of the goal. You see, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, our faith just shrivels up like a raisin. But as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can swim and we can swim and we can run and we can run. You remember Peter? Peter was walking on water. That's pretty good. Until he began to look at the ocean and began to look at the waves. And he began to sink because he took his eyes off the Lord. The key to pressing on and running this race with endurance is what we'll look at tomorrow, that we fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and God supernaturally empowers us by His grace to be able to press on in the Christian life. But not only have we seen the stadium and the stripping down and the stumbling sin and the steadfastness, but I want you to now note, and this is very important, the striving after. Please note in verse 12, he says, and... Let us run with endurance. Next two words, the race. I'm going to pronounce this Greek word because you're going to hear the English word in it. Run with endurance, the agon, the agony. The Christian life isn't a short wind sprint, a 50-yard dash. Christian life is the agony. It is the long-term marathon for the rest of your life. And the word agon indicates pain and pushing through the pain and difficulty and sweat and sacrifice 
and suffering. This is a part of the Christian life of which we need to be reminded tonight. That it's not let go and let God. A passive Christianity that neuters us of human responsibility. But the Christian life is realized as we run the agon, as we run this agony, as we strive after holiness, as we resist temptation, as we flee worldliness, as we discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, as we buffet our body and make it our slave, as we fight the good fight, as we follow after Christ, as we take up our cross and, and move out in the Christian life. And many times it is, it is an uphill run. It is heartbreak hill like at the Boston Marathon. And there are times when the wind is blowing against us and the, the elements and the, the storms of life are, are breaking over our head. But we have to press on and keep on in this race of faith. Sanctification is not a passive thing. It, 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 is, it is like running a race. It, it involves our pressing on to what lies ahead, to widening our stride and picking up our pace and pumping our knees and pressing through the pain. Running necessitates that you not remain where you are, but that you take decisive steps of faith and you move forward in order to advance in godliness. Let's face it, there are too many spiritual couch potatoes who just want to sit on a sofa and eat popcorn and watch television in the Christian life. Instead, they ought to be disciplining themselves. They ought to be disciplining themselves in prayer, disciplining themselves in the Word of God, disciplining themse themselves in coming to church, disciplining themselves in serving God, disciplining themselves in, in witnessing, disciplining themselves in giving of their resources to the Lord's work. This running involves laboring in prayer, digging into the Word, soul-searching to apply the Word of God to our lives, repenting of sin, uprooting roots of bitterness, resisting temptation, staying on track, shedding excess weight, mortifying the flesh. This is all a part of living the Christian life. Listen, if it was easy, we'd all be like Jesus. Finally, I want you to see the straightaway. As we come to the end of verse 1, after he says, let us run with endurance the race, he concludes this verse by implying the track. The race that is set before us. You don't have to go to the mission field to find this track. You don't have to go to another country or another land to find this race. Uh, there'll be some of us that the Lord will call to go to another land or to another place. If you're a big-time marathon runner, you're going to have to go to New York. You're going to have to go to Boston. You're going to have to get on an airplane and go to London to, to be a world champion marathon runner. You can't just stay at home and run against the local talent. But the Christian life, it's right in front of us. It's just set right before you. It, it's as plain as day. And it is God Himself who has planned this track who has foreordained this track, who has built this track, and it is God Himself who travels with us as we go down this straightaway. Now, how do we know what it is? 
Let me just give you a couple things here that you can know what the race is, the track is, that's immediately before you. Number one, it's revealed in Scripture. God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And as we live in this dark and sinful, adulterous generation, it is the Word of God that is shining brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above. There is the perspicuity, the clarity, the lucidness of Scripture. It's not hard to understand. It's just hard to swallow at times. But it's as clear as the noonday sun right in front of your eyes. It is revealed in Scripture. It is enlightened in prayer. Paul prayed for the Colossians that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with spiritual wisdom and understanding. We, we, we have to pray and ask for God to guide us and to direct us and to set our feet onto this path. It is exemplified in Christ. Every step is following Jesus Christ. And as we read the Scriptures and learn about Christ, we are to walk as He walked. We are to run as He ran. It is confirmed by godly counsel. Proverbs says there's victory in a multitude of counselors. And it is unfolded by providence. God closes a door that no man can open, and God opens a door that no man can close. And as George Mueller said, and Matthew Henry said, we follow providence. We follow the Word of God. We follow Christ's example. We follow the counsel of other godly people. And it is sealed in prayer. This race always leads us away from sin. It never leads us to sin, always away from sin. This race leads us into the world. It never leads us uh, away from the world. We are told to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. We are to penetrate this, this world. This race is toward the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. And this race is run with the few. It's not run with the many. The many are on the broad path. The many are, on, are in the rat race. We're to be in the right race. And that is the few. We are to run on the narrow path that is laid out by the Word of God, and we are to run by the grace of God. It is in our weakness that His strength is made perfect within us. It is as we come to the end of ourselves that we know the fullness of His strength and the fullness of His power in our lives. So I want to ask you this question. Are you in the race? Have you committed your life to Jesus Christ? Because the moment you repent of your sin, the moment you surrender your life and entrust your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are put into the race. Are you in the race? Are you running the race? Are you picking up your pace? Are you widening your stride? Is your chest out? Are your arms pumped? Are your eyes on the finish line where the Lord Jesus Christ is? Or could you be in danger of slowing down when you ought to be picking up your pace? When I was a young boy, I ran on my school's track team. And our school entered several different track teams, starting with the slowest and then the fastest team. I naturally ran on the fastest team. <laughs> that was humor. <laughs> I told the men the day before yesterday, do not be a hero of your own story. I'm going to break that rule. <laughs> 
I ran on our school's fastest team, and I ran the anchor leg on the fastest team. That means you run last, and they put the baton into your hand last. All the other schools entered their multiple teams, and the slower teams all ran their race, and after they had run their race, they then went up into this huge football stadium with the parents and the student body, and by the time it came to the last race, it was our race. And I went and found my position out on the track there at that final curve as it would come around the the final curve and then come down the straightaway to the finish line. And when the gun sounded and the, the race began, the relay race went all the way around the track. And as it was coming to me, my heartbeat was picking up. And we had a little bit of a lead. And I remember when he put the baton into my hand, I took that baton and ran as fast as my legs could carry me. And being the last race, everyone else who had already run the race, they were all up in the stands, and nobody had left, and the student bodies and the parents. And as I came running down the, that straightaway, everyone rose to their feet, and I could just hear them cheering us on. And there was no way that I was going to give up that lead and have to face my, my schoolmates and my, and my teammates. And I crossed the finish line, and I looked around, and we had won the race. That's really the imagery here. That the greats of the faith from the Old Testament, down through the centuries, have already run their race. And they are now seated in the grandstands of heaven above. And by the example of their lives, they are cheering us on. And this relay race, the gospel has come down to you and me in this century and in this generation. And the baton now has been put into your hand. And there's the blood of the martyrs on this baton. And there is the sweat of those who have gone before us and who have labored to, to get us a little bit of a lead to put the gospel into our hand. And now that it is in our hand, we must run with all the might and strength that God will give us. We can't allow any sin to, to trip us up. And this is no time to be running with, with excess baggage and excess weight. It's time to let this world go and to go for God and to run the race that is set before us. And when we feel the resistance and when we feel the pressures and the storms and the, the elements blowing against us, we must press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And there is coming a final day when we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and the judge of heaven and earth will be seated and every runner in the race on that last day will stand before the Lord as if there had never been another runner on the track. And our entire life will come under review. No sin will appear in that day, but how we ran the race will be the subject of that examination. And did we pursue holiness? Did we turn our back to the world? Did we press on to the upward call of God? Did we invest our life in the things of God? And He will take the crown of life, the Stephanos, and place it upon the heads of those who have run the race to win. And He will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And that is why Paul says that we must run but not without aim. Uh, we must run the race and we must buffet our body and make it our slave, lest after preaching to others we would be a docomas, disqualified and put out of the race.
May God light a fire under every runner here tonight. When we leave this meeting, we need to storm the gates of hell with a water pistol. When we leave this meeting tonight, you and I need to be so turbocharged that we are running with all of the strength that God will give us to live the Christian life. There will be no shuffling. There will be no strolling. Uh, There will be no crawling. But that every single one of us will go for broke for God. And we will run the race that God has set before us. May God, may God blow with the wind of heaven at your back tonight. And may you be propelled forward as never before in your Christian life to run faster and straighter and stronger than you have ever run in your Christian life. And you will glorify God by running in such a way. It's like Eric Little said, when I run, I feel His pleasure. When you run the race of faith, you feel the pleasure of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for such a great stadium that you have provided for us in which we run this race. Lord, help us to shed excess baggage and not to stumble over a failure to trust you. Help us run the race that you have set before us. And let us run as we have never run before. Father, may we bring great glory to your name by the way that we are on track with our spiritual lives. And may it inspire other runners to pick up their pace and to run yet faster and straighter. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.